It's oxygen. Probably me. Carbon dioxide, yeah. Free of carbon dioxide. You feel euphoric, won't you? Yeah. You'll make the talk for a while. This talk's amazing. Start seeing things. I can't feel any air. We all comfortable? No, I shouldn't have said that. It's off, we're going to start anyway. Right, hello everyone, thanks for coming along. Um, I'm Dan, in case you haven't realised by now. Hello, Dan. Hello, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, uh, as you can tell from my wonderful t-shirt, I'm from uh, Linux Outlaws, which you might have heard of. It's a podcast about Linux and free software. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about audio production today on Linux. Um, unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be able to see this very well, but we'll do our best. Um, I am going to try and do a bit of a demo later in Audacity as well. A bit of uh, produ producing the uh, software for even launch shows, so that should be interesting. So you can all be co-producers for that one. Hey, we will get credit. <laughs> yeah, but no money. Ah. No. It's, it's all for the fame. That's all it's for. Right, so let's get started and see if this works. Ah, okay, cool. Very efficiently, I put an agenda up first. So uh, this is what I kind of want to go over today. Um, basically, yeah, quick introduction about who I am, stuff like that. Um, a bit of an audio production background kind of principles thing, so basic stuff. Um, to get everyone up to speed. Um, some stuff about the, the software and hardware that I use, tools and stuff. Um, and then we're going to get into the demo, which is about the Software Freedom Law Show, which I'll tell you more about later. Uh, and then this works. Look, it's working well. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you a bit about how we produce Linux outlaws, which is slightly different to the Software Freedom Law Show. And at the end, I've got a bit of stuff about music production on Linux, which is slightly different. And uh, probably have a bit of a discussion on that, because there's some hairy uh, areas around music production with Linux, which I know some of you are probably run into, and discussion and questions, hopefully. So, <laughs> we see how that goes. So, am I? Oh, I've gone too far. Oh, I yeah. Right, go on, mate. The question I often ask myself, um, <coughs> usually when alcohol is involved, um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm from the other end of the M62. So, um, I'm not sure I'll get on now here tonight, but we're going to go. Uh, so, uh, as you know, at the other end of the M62, we all look like that. Uh, most of us, anyway. I'm sure. Can you see that? Man? That's uh, that's me at a family meeting. Um, yeah, quite a big family, actually. Mostly men as well, which is strange. Um, so moving on, anyway. Um, yeah, I'm a I, I'm a, a musician, really. By I say by trade. Um, not that I've ever been paid that much to do it, but um, I started off. I went to music college um, originally. Did sound engineering professionally for bands and things on the road and in studios, which is kind of how I got into the whole audio thing. Um, and I also, as I said, host Linux Outlaws. There's a wonderful cartoon picture of me there, which I didn't draw. Um, and I produced the Software Freedom Law Show for uh, the SFLC. They're the guys who kind of enforce the GPL. They're based in New York. Uh, that's where Evan Modlin, the Modlin works, who's the, the main lawyer for the FSF. And uh, a lot of the other guys there. Um, I'm also a floss advocate, which is why I'm here. And uh, I do a few other things like web development, hosting, general waffling, writing. Uh, and I've got a small production company called Half Baked Media as well. Uh, so let's move on. Okay, so uh, this is probably a bit obvious because I'm sure most of you listen to podcasts in this room. But just in case, I thought I'd tell you quickly what a podcast is, or what I think a podcast is. Um, it's a pre recorded piece of media, um, in you know, all already produced and everything, uh, which is then uploaded to the web and downloaded by listeners um, around the world. Uh, it's on demand, so it's not broadcast live. It's a bit confusing because some people say to me, you can do a podcast live, but technically you can't because a podcast is always a file put onto a server. Radio is something slightly different. You could do a radio show and record it while you do it live and then make that a podcast. It's not quite the same thing. It's, it's a, I suppose, me being pedantic about terms, but there you go. It is slightly different, uh, radio thing. It can be audio or video. Um, I don't do video, to be honest. Um, I'm not that good at video editing, plus with this face it's a bit difficult. So uh, I don't try, don't try to do that. Um, yep, nothing to do with Apple iPods, which is something I'm always keen to point out. Although they kind of coined the term podcast. You can listen to them on the computer or any MP3 or all the player. Um, yep, so the, uh, that basically covers it. I think most people... Everybody listening to podcasts? Yeah. So you kind of get it. You already know what that is. I recycled that slide from the last talk, so I can't um, Right, 
Okay, so audio production. It's quite a um, it's quite a fine art actually, audio production. I, I don't say that just because I do it and I'm for myself. Um, it is it is quite quite interesting. Um, and I thought like I'd give you a bit of background on the basics and things that you can do to make things sound good, which is what engineers, sound engineers, whole job is making things sound good. Um, and the basics are really the starting points have nothing to do with technology, which might sound strange to you, but um, the really basic things that you need to get right are things like background noise, like these little chaps in the bar here, um, and stuff like that. When you're recording something, um, the best thing you can do is find the best location, eliminate things like background noise, because although you can filter it out later on with all kinds of fancy technology, it's a lot of work, and it's much easier if you just get a good source recording to start with. That's the best thing. Um, so yeah, background noise and environment, that's quite important. Um, and as I said, the better, source, the better the source recording, the easier your job will be later when you've got to edit it. Um, use the best microphone for the job. So I'll talk more about this later for people who aren't microphone nuts like me. Um, but obviously, this is something you pick up over experience. Years and stuff. Different mics are best for different situations, all that kind of stuff. Um, so find out which the best one is, use that, it always helps. Um, it's a big part of the battle. Um, you don't need to be pushing the recorder. The reason I said that was um, there's a lot of most people use digital recorders these days, and um, unlike the old tape recorders that we all know and love, they really don't like it if you put too much input into them. So if you put too much volume, you don't get a nice, lovely, warm distortion like you would with a tape. You get a lovely clicking uh, signal, which is really horrible. So um, with most digital recorders, you don't really need to be anywhere near the top of the, the recording maximum. You only need to go halfway. Always boost it later. That's the great thing about digital recording. Um, and then uh, no technology. Oh, this is a bit of a strange point, but no technology can substitute for your ears. That's true. Um, if something sounds right to you, then that's kind of the main thing, because you're the one who you know, knows what, what you want it to sound like. And there's no substitute for these things on the side of your head when it comes to producing audio. No technology can kind of bail you out if you if you take deaf or you can't, but you can't hear what you want. You need to be decisive. So, that's what you want. <coughs> okay, so hang on, I've gone too far. No, that's right. Yeah, I just realised I didn't mention that. That was pre-production, by the way. That's all the stuff you should get right before you start. And you should probably introduce that before you tell people about it. But that's all pre-production <laughs> stuff. So this is like post-production, a quick post-production thing. So techniques that we kind of use a lot um, as sound engineers. Um, compression is probably one that you've heard about, you may have heard about. That's one that sound engineers use a lot. Um, so how does it work? Well, basically, I've put this wave file. I don't know if you can all see that. There's a bit of a jagged wave file there for you to see. Because it illustrates quite nicely the dramatic change in volume between these sections. So you can see this is really quiet here. And then there's this big loud bit. And it kind of goes a bit quiet later. And when you're producing uh, audio, you really don't want big leaps in volume most of the time. Uh, certainly for like radio stuff, talk stuff. If you're doing classical music, possibly you might want a big dramatic leap. But just for the purposes of this talk, we'll stick to talk stuff. Um, so you really want to level that out, and that's what a compressor does for you. And you can have a software compressor, or you can get a hardware one. It doesn't matter. But all it basically does, like the name suggests, is it takes those jagged wave files and squashes them. And it brings up the quiet parts. It brings down the loud parts and levels it out. And you've got to be careful, because I mean, if you go ridiculous, you make it completely flat, it doesn't sound very good. But it can help a lot if you've got somebody you say you've got a microphone and they're going like this and talking into it moving away. Because the volume changes, it's not going to sound good. Um, so if you can level that out, it makes a big difference. Um, noise removal, or noise gates. And this is getting a bit audio geeky. Um, a noise gate basically is, um, as the name suggests, it's, uh, it switches the signal on and off as a, a gate. And what you do is you set a, a basic level. So if I wanted to filter out that noise from the guys outside, I could set, find out how loud that is, set the level there. So whenever I speak, it will open and record. So my voice is louder than the threshold. It will get through the gate, if you like. And then when I stop speaking, it cuts the pictures, the gate, and we'll cut them thumbs off. So it kind of cuts out background noise and stuff. I'll show you a demo of that later on, um, so it makes a bit more sense. And limiters are a bit kind of the same. They just set the peak level, maximum that your body can be. Um, so it will probably make more sense when we get into the demo. Um, probably. You've got to actually really point at that, yeah. I think. Yeah. You've got to like... Okay. <laughs> Let me check out. I'm just going to get this one. Okay. 
I'm showing off the practice before. Um, yeah, so stuff that I use, my, my studio, um, I don't know if you'll be able to see that, this is my home studio here. I'll kind of move it a bit forward so you can see. That's my home studio, the one on the left. Uh, that's where I work most of the time. Um, and uh, that's um, the basic kit that I use, uh, which is a Soundcraft 328 digital mixer, which I didn't bring with me, unfortunately, so handy. Uh, can't fit, I can't bother carrying it, it's too big. That's the big de mixing desk on there. Um, and also, this thing on the left is um, an RME HDSP 9652. It's like an audio card, it's an audio interface. And it's, uh, it's an optical one, so it's got like, uh, I think it's 24 channels, optical. Yeah. Yeah. Optical. Yeah. Um, so you need optical lead. But you can connect that to, you, you can obviously connect the outputs from the mixer to your computer, which is the idea. And the great thing about that is it's fully supported by Alsa. So um, it works brilliant under Linux. And even all the, the tools that uh, RMA are quite a good company, they've ported all of their Windows tools into Linux, um, all their special mixers and things. You can get Linux versions, which is really handy. That's why I use them. Yeah, I'll put the slides up and, um, and I'll, I'll put them on the. I'll give them to Lucy. You can put them on the website, or I'll put them on my website and put them up for everyone. Uh, that's no problem. Um, that's quite a high-end card, obviously. So it'd probably be more than you would want for basic recording. That's like, to be honest, probably more than I need. But I fancy this. <laughs> Plus, I got it for eBay secondhand. Uh, but um, yeah, it is, it is a nice, nice card, and um, that's the basic, the basic setup for the studio. It's, it's a normal. Um, AMD, it's not a high, particularly high-powered PC. I uh, use AMD X2 4200 CPU. It's only about two gigahertz, something like that, dual core. So it's not a fantastically powerful PC. Two gig of RAM, which these days, at the time I got it, was ridiculous. But now everybody's got two gig of RAM. It's not quite, not quite so uh, something to brag about as it used to be. Um, yeah. Various hard disks and stuff, and there's all kinds of outboard gear which I don't think we need to get into. Um, the main microphone that I use for recording is what I use for um, for all the shows that I do. It's actually but, um, this is the main one that I use. You can actually see it there on the shop. Can, this is called an uh, ADK A51, about 100 quid. It's not even like a high end one. They make uh, ADK isn't a fantastic maker. They make kind of copies of um, well-known microphones, and they actually sound really good. I've been surprised, but they sound as good as the originals. You can pass that around if you want. Don't drop it, please. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Um, Neumann, um, as Randy suggested, there's about a few grand for one of them. Yeah. That's a hundred quid. My college, I've got a 16 grand. Yeah, exactly. Was it an original? Yeah. Wow, were you 87? Uh, I can't remember what month it was on the ice. We had to drive in and we went and had to check. I'm not sure. So I'm on that back at the end as well, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a quite a basic mic, but it, it sounds really good. Everything that you, if you if you ever listen to our podcast, then basically that's what you've heard my voice through is that. I also do music stuff with it as well, as well. Um, speakers, I use Absolute Zero speakers, uh, Spirit Absolute Zero, which I like. It's a personal choice. Um, they seem to do the job. So onto the uh, onto the software. Get this right in a okay, there you go. Software. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so software stuff. Uh, for, this, for the podcasts, um, for all the audio production stuff that I do, I usually use, at the moment, I'm using Ubuntu Studio, the 64 bit edition, which is, um, some of you probably use Ubuntu Studio, it's basically just Ubuntu with um, a special kernel on it, a real time kernel, which um, reduces latency and stuff like that for your recording. Um, it's really handy as well. It comes, it comes with Jack and stuff like that, so I'll, I'll talk about Jack in a minute. Um, and it's quite handy for that. I've also used 64 Studio in the past as well, which is actually a British distro um, made by a guy called Daniel James, who I know quite well. He's, um, he's doing a really good job with it, but um, at the moment I switched to it once, just because it's <coughs> fancy to change. And, you know, grass is always green on the other side. Um, so i to try it out, but um, yeah, uh, 64 Studio is like a Debian. It's Debian kind of customised for music, so. Essentially, they're both customised Debian 
distros in a way. Um, there are other distros available. There's one called Musics, which I've never tried. I don't know what that's like. But there's a few, but the main two are probably Ubuntu Studio and um, 64 Studio. And I like Ubuntu Studio, it works really well. Um, so I use um, Jack and Arvo. Jack, I'll, I'll explain a bit of what. I'm not an expert on Jack, and I'm always tempted to, to use the joke, you don't know Jack. You know, it's a common, common thing you hear a lot. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, that's something you hear a lot, is you don't know Jack. Um, Unfortunately, as we were talking before, um, one of the guys from Livelog, Bob, he's, uh, he does know Jack. <laughs> it turns out a lot of the stuff he's written is actually in um, different distributions, a lot of the tools that he's written for Jack. So I used to think I knew what I was talking about until I saw his talk. Um, so, fortunately, he couldn't make it tonight. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so um, Jack is um, it's another one of these recursive acronyms like GNU or um, Wine or various others. So it stands for Jack Audio Connection Kit, which is why it's a recursive acronym. And uh, it basically its job is to sit in front of Elsa and uh, act like a server, uh, like a proxy server if you like. So it sits as a layer in front of your Elsa sound uh, architecture. And it allows you to um, have multiple connections come into and from it, and it will route audio from one application to another. And it just sits in front of Elsa and allows you to have like many connections to Elsa at once. So it's essentially like a yeah, exactly. It actually has a virtual cache. Good point. Yeah, it actually. Sorry. Uh, yeah. A few people, lots of people would say no. Uh, which is one really one good thing about having something like Ubuntu Studio because uh, it comes with a lot of that stuff done for you, which is really handy. It's actually not as hard as, as I thought it was when I first tried it. When you first try it, it is daunting, I admit. But um, it's not that hard as long as you've got a decent audio card. And you, you can fiddle with the settings a bit and make sure optimize them, but it's not too bad. I mean, it comes with a virtual patch bay, which um, I haven't got a picture of it, unfortunately, but as you mentioned, the patch bay before, every, every uh, application that you start, say, I don't know, um, Akiga and um, Hydrogen and something else, you can start all those three, and it will show them as virtual ports in Jack, in Jack. So you can then draw a line from the output of Akiga to the input of something else to the output. And you just weave them like that. And you just like kind of you do all that kind of stuff and you use it as a virtual patch so And it works really well. Like yeah, kind of, yeah. It's, it is very like rewire actually. Um, but I mean it, it is can be a bit awkward to set up. I mean I noticed a few people laughing there. It can be can be tricky, but once you get it going it is really worth the effort. Um, I think it is anyway. So um, yeah, Jack is, is kind of this layer that I use that sits in front of um, if you use Ardor, Ardor is a as it says there, digital audio workstation, that's like your equivalent of Pro Tools or Cubase maybe or something like that. Or Cakewalk, if you're old, I used to use Cakewalk. Um, so now, yeah, yeah. I, I gave up on it years ago, I think it's about 12 years since I used Cakewalk. Um, but yeah, it's basically a, um, a, a big audio editing and, and um, audio workstation, a door, as they call it, digital audio workstation. And it's very like Pro Tools or something like that. I think it's designed to be like Pro Tools. Um, so it comes with all kinds, all kinds of fancy stuff. And Ardor, to be fair, is pretty difficult to get into. First, it's a bit like using Blender. I don't know if you've ever used Blender in 3D graphics. I love Blender, and I love the guys that do it. But I can't help work out what you're supposed to do with it when you open it. I don't know. Maybe I'm not in their target audience or whatever. But, uh, it takes a while to get used to. But Ardor is, is good as well. It's worth the effort. Um, so they kind of link together. You have to use Jack with Ardor. You have to use Ardor. You have to use Jack to make Ardor work, but it is worth the effort. Um, so we'll talk. I'll show you a bit of that later. But um, the main thing that I use is probably something that you've used yourselves, which is Audacity, which a lot of people laugh at. But I do 90% of my work in Audacity these days, um, and it works really well. It's a basic uh, audio editor, uh, multifunctional. Um, it does multiple channels, which is quite handy, so you can import all your different files. And I'll, I'll give you a demo of that. After have on different channels, set the volumes, uh, mess about. The, main, the only problem issue that I have with, with Audacity is sometimes it um, can be a bit temperamental. I don't know exactly what it is, but occasionally it'll just freeze on you. So you've got to make sure you save everything like every couple of minutes, make sure you save what you've done. Doesn't Audacity have auto save? It does, but it doesn't and always work. Crash save. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> it is supposed to recover things as well. When you open Audacity, yeah, yeah. often it'll come up and say, would you like to recover this project? Um, so sometimes that works, but 99% of the time it works well. And as I say, all the stuff that I produce 
I pretty much use Audacity in terms of podcasts. It does a really good job. So I'll do a demo of that. Um, what else have we got? Okay, yeah. Um, so finally, the last kind of addition to the studio stuff that I use at the moment is the latest one, um, which is like the mobile recording stuff that I use. And I've actually brought it with me today. Um, this is the, I'll let you pass this around as well. Um, yeah, this is um, this is a, a piece of kit that I got recently. It's called a Zoom Handy Recorder, H4. And um, as you see, the 200 quid new. Uh, I got this one for about 110 of you. And as you can tell, I get lost a few. Jeez. But um, yeah, it's um, it's quite handy. I mean, we did we recently went to Germany. Uh, I went to the uh, Linux Tag in Berlin. And we did a lot of interviews and stuff there, and I used this for that. It's got two inbuilt condenser mics on the top there, which is really handy. And um, it's also got XLRs on it. A lot of people, yeah, it's true, actually. A lot of people say that. Um, I don't know, I usually try and convince them. When it's got the pop shield on it, it doesn't look quite as much like a table. And, uh, maybe they stand still as a frame. That's it, maybe, yeah. Maybe they think I won't notice them if they see the um, no, it seems to work okay. Um, it, I, I noticed when I was at the event that uh, there were some guys there from something called Radio Tux, which is like a German Linux radio station. And uh, they were all running around with these as well, so apparently these are the end of the podcast. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe I'm just following the crowd. You know? <laughs> and, uh, this works really well. It records to SD cards, standard SD cards, um, which is really handy. I can get, at the moment, I've got a 4 gig SD card. And uh, that'll. It's at, I can even tell you, I'll switch it on. Rather than get it wrong, I'll switch it on. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a lot, it is quite a lot. It records to, uh, to WAV files and it also records to MP3 if you're in really short space and you can't. It'll do like a 320 kilobit MP3, which is okay for an interview. Um, it does up to 96 kilohertz as well, 96 24 bit recording, so it does like the full thing. I don't use it for that to be honest. <laughs> this is the problem with live demos. Something always, I didn't push it back in. Something always goes wrong. Um, yeah, it does about five, five and a half hours, six hours of uh, CD quality. So that's 44 kilobits, 44 uh, That's with the 4 gig card. So like five, five and a half hours. Is that as a WAV file? Yeah, it's just as a standard WAV file on the SD card. Um, yeah, it's so the batteries don't run out first on uh, Yeah, exactly. The batteries are, are pretty go out pretty quick on it. But, but you've got AA batteries, so it just takes pencils, AA batteries, so How many? Just two. So uh, I mean I have I've used this for I recorded the last Linux albums on this last night. Um, and the batteries are fine. Uh, I can probably do another few hours on it. Um, you do get the files are big though, that was about Gig, just every gig, that one file from last night, of just my voice from the next um, So I'll pass that around as well, you can have a look at it. That's what I use at the moment. Um, it's very versatile, so it costs about £200 new. Um, I'm a big fan of them. And uh, it works, as, if you plug it into your uh, by USB, it just shows up as a mass storage device, so you just drag the files and drag them off. It's new, MS device. Or you can take the card out, show the card in the PC, well, it does the same job. Um, it takes AA batteries and stuff. Um, yep, so it is really handy, and uh, it's coming, it's been probably one of my best purchases recently. There we go. Um, so, part of the fun stuff. Um, the Software Freedom Law Show, one of the podcasts that I produce, um, I'll give you a bit of a background on that and how we produce the show. Um, it's a fortnightly podcast from the SFLC, that's the Software Freedom Law Center, they're based in Manhattan, in New York. Um, and they're like the legal, they used, they kind of, they almost, I don't know if they describe themselves as this, but they're almost the legal arm of the FSF. They deal with all, the FSF is their main client, and that's what they deal with is GPL violations, stuff like that, they enforce the GPL. Um, they've done a lot of work for Busybox, you might have seen in the news. Um, they've done a lot of the kind of legal stuff for Busybox, and you know, suing people who use their software without contributing back. So violate the GPLs. Um, the show started about a year ago, just under a year. Um, I got involved because uh, I, I actually met, uh, or I, I interviewed Bradley Kuhn, who's the um, 
may kind of technical guy, I guess if I'll say. We interviewed him on Linux Outlaws and um, he phoned me up one day and said he wanted to do a podcast. And would I produce it for him? So I said, yeah, of course. Um, so we ended up getting to that. But one of his big things that he said to me, this is, if you know Bradley, you'll know why. Uh, this is, he could only use free software to produce the show. And he made me promise, like, you know, swear on my heart that I wouldn't use anything like that used to produce the show. And I haven't. I mean, not that you would know, but I haven't, <laughs> honestly. Um, just because out of principle, I, I just wouldn't, wouldn't lie to him and do that. But uh, yeah, that was a big thing. He said only if you can produce it with free software. Um, we'll, we'll, will we do it? So we did. Um, and then my role as producer, what do I do as producer? Um, I advise them on equipment and stuff. Um, like their recording gear, I tell them what mics to get, um, how the techniques to record and stuff like that. Simple stuff like, like I said before, simple stuff like switch off the aircon if you're going to record because it goes all the way through in the background. So just switch that off for half an hour while you record the show. It saves a lot of hassle. I have issues yeah, a lot of people have problems with that. Um, a lot of people get these um, studio machines and get like all the packing stuff. You can get them acoustically treated and all that. But I never bothered. But you can. You can get them all like properly acoustically treated so that they're fine. Luckily, mine's quite quiet anyway. So. Um, so the other stuff I do is I edit the show together uh, from the recordings that they make, uh, and I encode it to Argon MP3 at the end and send it back to them so they can they can uh, put the show out. I think there's another slide in this one. So Ah, okay. So, uh, the fun bit. Uh, this is, yeah, the stuff that, um, so this is, I'll take you through how we produce the show, um, how it kind of comes together. This is uh, the, ma the mic that I told them to get. I haven't got one to pass around before. But this is the mic that I told them to get, which is an AKG uh, C1000. They're quite common, actually. Um, they're, uh, they're about 100 quid. And, uh, they're about as good as you can get, I would say. I mean, all right, maybe they're not the £16,000 annoying but, you know, we try. Um, yeah, and they do a really good job, so that's all they use. If you've ever listened to the show, they just have one of those mics plugged into a laptop. Um, and I believe Bradley, Bradley uses a record. You know, the, the terminal uh, thing, he uses a record. Yeah, he, um, he, he just connects it to Elsa through a USB. He's got a USB interface. I think I've actually got one here. Is it a bit more hard because he has a safety to the recording machine? He might do, he might do. He's a pretty hardcore guy. Yeah, I, I don't know, but he does, he does use a recorder on the terminal, and he just makes like a wave file and then uh, and then sends it to me. But this is, um, I don't know if he actually uses this model, but this is the kind of interface that he uses. Uh, it's, this is a Behringer, this is the USB audio interface, got photos on it. You see. Stereo in and out. Uh, works great with Elsa, you just plug it in and it works on, on any Linux system. Uh, that's one of the things I like about it. It's got even got monitors on it, all kinds of monitor levels. Like They're about 20 quid, which is not expensive if you want to get into something like this. 20 quid doesn't cost a lot. Yeah, you can pass that around if you want to buy it. Does that have like a phone over here? It doesn't, no. Um, Unfortunately. Um, just, just saying because it's better already to like record their vinyl. Jacks, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. You can get different models. That's the really basic one. That's 20 quid, as I said. You could probably get one. Uh, I should have looked, but you could probably get one for a bit more. It would do that kind of thing. Um, plus, if you've got a mixer and you've got your, your, you know, most people have their decks because it's like a DJ mixer anyway. Yeah. Just take a line of that into the photos. Um, so it would be handy for that. So. I don't know what headphones he uses. I think he just monitors it with his mind. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> what I use? Um, I use Sennheiser um, headphones mostly. I can't even remember the model number now. Um, I got them ages ago, and I've tried different ones, but they're the, they're the big over ear ones. Close back. So, yeah, yeah. So they, they are good, but they've got like a four foot. Um, Four foot lead on them. I don't know exactly why. But it, yeah, they've got a huge long lead on them. And rather, I mean, I don't like wireless headphones anyway because it's not a good idea. But the problem is with the long lead, you get up and you think, oh, because the lead's long enough, I'll just walk over there and listen to the phone or something. <laughs> so you do that and you get like, pick up the phone. And then you forget that you've got this big lead behind you and promptly turn around and call it out. Um, whilst ripping the desk out of the wall. Um, I've done that before. Uh, that's not fun. So, uh, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> yeah, it is now. Yeah. There's a word of warning for you. Um, yeah, so he records the stuff there, and he, he, made, he just gets um, 
he produces just a wave file, a mono wave file of, of the, the two guys, of him and Karen, who's the other coast, uh, talking in, in the office, in the SFLC office. They produce them and they put them on their web server somewhere um, in a little private directory where I can download them. Um, it takes a while to be honest, they're usually about, um, it's a show, it's about half an hour each time we do it, but the files are usually something like two or three hundred megabytes, so it's not massive, but it takes some while to download it. Um, so, as I put there, let's put together the software for the more show. So here we go. So I'm going to try and do a demo now. This is where I try and get out of the, uh, I think I'll just use this. Get out of that for now. And I'm going to open Audacity so you can see. This was the last show. This was actually released today, I believe. Or so I was told it was released today. Um, so this is, the, this was, I edited this last week. And then, it should be able to. Apologies for people standing behind me. Um, Okay. Actually, if I put it that way, you can get it in the video and then everyone can see it later. <laughs> um, okay. Let's just get this is, uh, yeah, some of the example files that you sent me. Um, so he numbers all his shows in hex for some reason. So uh, it's uh, OX12, it's the last show they did. So um, I don't know how well you'd be able to hear this, but I'll turn it to you. Um, so let's get the main file. I've already edited this, but just for the purposes of demonstration, I'll start it again just to show you what we've done. So I'm going to use Audacity for this. Um, as I said before, I use Audacity a lot. And that's just imported, what, 30 minutes of audio? And it's, okay, it's just still going through, but it's pretty quick. I mean, this isn't a particularly fantastic laptop either. This is a it says on an Intel Pentium dual core processor, T3100. So I don't think it's a stellar laptop, uh, a couple of gig of RAM in it. So, so this is their raw file. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear some of this. That's on full at the minute. So as you can hear, it's not very loud. So it's a bit of boosting. Um, let's stop that. So um, first things first, this is the raw recording of their show. Um, this show, look, normally there are a few more sections to the show. They usually have like an intro and then they have a main feature and then they'll have like a wrap up section. Uh, and they send me those in different files and then I cut music in between with um, Audacity. But for this show, they kind of just did one long section, half hour section. Um, so I'll show you what we do. Um, so if I go to file and then import audio, so I'm going to put the intro music on it first. That was a good place to start. Um, so there's a file here called Full Music, which is just a, an MP3. There you go. That one's in stereo. Can you see that's got two channels? Um, so we got, um, yeah, that's the intro music. Now, what we need to do, I'll just zoom in a bit. Um, one of the great things about Audacity, which took me a long time to work out, is that you can just move these about on the timeline. So, you know, to line them up where you want them. I, when I first started using Audacity, I didn't realize you could do that. I used to insert manually, like, so much silence. So you could push that. You used to not be able to do that. I stopped using Audacity because you couldn't do it. Oh, really? Okay. Well, you definitely can now, because otherwise I'd be pulling my hair out. Well, it wouldn't matter much these days. But I'd be pulling my hair out trying to, trying to do this. Um, so the first thing we'll do is, um, if I go back to the start. Don't, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to hear this that loud. That's the music that comes in the start. Guitar music. So I'll just show you how to do the intro. I won't do the whole show because we've been here all night. Um, if I just use the, that's like the, the move tool. I'll take that, that, that one there, with the two arrows on it, is the, is the kind of time shift tool, if you like. So I wonder if I can do this while well, looking the other way. Here we go. This is going to be interesting. Oh, yes, it's working. Um, so I'm just moving that along, as you can see, because we want the talking to start a bit later. And also, I want to fade the music out, because the music's quite longer. I usually only use quite a small bit of it. So then, we're going to use another tool called the envelope tool, which is... I'm going to have to look, I'm afraid. Which is... Uh, which one is it? It's that one. With the, okay. It's that one above with the little... Uh, little, blue, um, little blue arrows on it. And this is fantastic. So when, I, when I discovered this, I was going to say it changed my life, that might sound a bit dim, but a bit over the top, but it did kind of change my job quite a lot. Um, I mean, not a lot of audio editors do this. 
Uh, quite a few of the proprietary ones do now, but a lot of them didn't. So you, you do uh, left click on somewhere and it sets like a little region on there. And you can go through setting these. A few of them. And as you can see, I just grab that now. I can pull it down like that. So I can fade it out there. Or I could, if I want to have a spike, I can do that. Make it go up again in the middle. So you just kind of shape the, or the volume as you want it. Which is really great for doing a quick fade and then back in. So I'll show you how we do that. Um, so, let's just check the fade. Uh, this would have worked really well with the extreme. And that's a bit of a long fade. So, you should be able to hear it fade out now. You can see I've just pulled it down. And the music fades down, and then we can have the talking coming. Um, so that's basically what I do to fade things in and out most of the time. And it works really well, actually. It's one of the best things about it. So, uh, let's move that back. So, um, one of the other things about it is, as, as I was saying, you can have multiple files in there, and I've got two, obviously, you know, and then the music and the main bit of talking. But often we get up to 10 or 12 different channels going, it might we'll see one Linux Outlaws. I'll show you the, the last episode of Linux Outlaws, the last edit that I did for that, I think that was 12 channels or something like that. So when you come to, to edit, to mix it out at the end, it kind of makes the laptop chug along quite slowly, but it does the job. And um, so we'll fade that out, and you can set the individual volumes and pan and all that kind of stuff with the, the channels down the side, which is quite handy. So I'll boost the talking a bit, because the talking was quiet, so I'll turn it up quite a bit. Say 10 degrees like uh, Okay, so just I'll show you quickly how we do the, the intro now. So if I need to import one more file for the intro, import audio. Uh, cold open. He even puts cold open on it, he's so professional. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's the term they use in TV, apparently, when someone does an announcement at the start of the show, it's called the cold open. I didn't know that until they started doing this. <laughs> and, uh, if anyone asks, I knew that all along. <laughs> it's on video, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Edit it out. The tape might go missing. Okay. So, as you can see, this is really quiet as well. So this is a good chance to use compression. Um, you can see there how quiet that is compared to the music. And what I was saying before about using your ears to kind of judge, um, one of the main things that I do is when I'm mixing a show, because I, I know this music's been really well produced and optimised and it's at like the perfect level, I make I use the music as my reference for how loud I want the talking to be. So that's kind of what I do and that always gives me a rough idea. Because there's nothing worse than when you get like a podcast and somebody's produced it with the volume really low, so you have to turn the volume right up on your... On your you play it like your iPod, whatever it can be. Um, it also wrecks the audio quality, so it doesn't help. Um, so all I'll do um, is select that, double click it, go to effects, uh, compressor is there. That's the one. Uh, there we go. It's the compressor. I was saying before, you set like a threshold, which is um, the level below which you want to compress the sound, like. So it's set to 12 dB, um, and they've changed the little set of the controls in Audacity. Rather than having a nice slider like you used to have, you get these weird little widgets, and you have to kind of hover the mouse over it and then use the scroll button to change the value. Which I'm probably trying to get more like uh, Cubase. Yeah, quite stuff, possibly. Probably. Possibly, but I find it quite annoying, really. So I'm going to set this quite low because it's, and I'll set the ratio up quite a lot. So you can see on there what it's going to do. The blue line is like the compression; it's going to squash it. Yeah. Um, if you were doing music or something, you probably wouldn't want to kill it like this. And, but as I say, because it's talking, you want to kind of get a consistent level. And you see what it's done to the, to the wave file there. You saw what it looked like before. And that's what it looks like now. It's, it's made it a lot louder, which is good. So um, we need to set this in the right position. This is the initial, like, welcome to the sort of Freedom Wall show. It certainly lasts a second. Uh, so I'll mute this a second. the music. Eight 
seconds from that. Yeah. So we need to talk, it's been eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> no, John, no. See, you have to say John and not Simon. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, when it wasn't you, did you better say it was Simon? You are, you do look like poised for. I can possibly comment. I think I'm just out of range, so go for it. <laughs> I'll squash this poor kid down here, though. <laughs> Okay, so I apologize if this might be a bit boring while I'm doing this, but I'm just going to try and set the um, import bit here. Is that a board and you on the lack of oxygen board? Okay, so you can see what I was doing there. With the envelope tool again, I'm just going to pull it down a bit, just where we want the talking, so I've just made it a bit quieter on that section. And then I'll use the other tool to grab the talking and get the right place. So yeah, you use the time shift again, move it along, to about there. It's only I've made that quite long enough. This isn't going to be perfect, obviously I spend a bit of time getting it right, usually, uh, but just for demonstration purposes. I hate these touch pads. I think I've actually managed to sweat on the touch pads. <laughs> So now if we listen to that, you'll be able to hear what it's all going to be. Get ready to crowd to it. This is episode one, two of the Software Freedom Law Show. There you go. So that's basically an example of how, and during something like a, uh, I don't know, say, we should stop this. Um, during something like an almost two hour episode of Linksart Laws, we might end up doing that a hundred times, fading bits in and out. But that's basically the method of how we do it. I'll spare you doing the rest of the show because we'll be here till about 12 o'clock. Um, but that's kind of like a little tour of how I use Audacity mostly. Um, the cool thing about it, as I said, I mean, the compression was quite handy. Um, this is bog standard Ubuntu on it, so I haven't got all the. When you install Ubuntu Studio, you get like a massive pack of plugins, which um, uh, L. L. LDSPA, I think it is. Landspa? L A D S P A. Landspa. Um, which is like the plugin standard, and there's loads of them. There's about 700 or 800 plugins in the pu plugin pack in Ubuntu Studio. As I said, this is normal Ubuntu. I haven't installed the plugin pack. I've only got a few. But um, you can do anything really. You can do all kinds with them. So those plugins, the kind of 800 plugins, I haven't even had a chance to use half of those yet. Um, but there is a lot of stuff to be explored. So that's kind of the basics of how we make it sound good. So I'll show you one I made earlier in best blue Peter fashion. Um, Okay, so this is the finished show. Uh, actually, it should open. As I say, this was released today. It might take a little bit to open. But this is the, the finished show that we did. Um, there's a few more channels, as you can tell. Let me zoom out a bit. I'm not seeing much there because it's zoomed quite in. Yeah, that's the finished show. You can see there's lots more channels there, still fading in and out. Kind of, that's the music, something else there, another announcement. And then when we're finished with that, I just export it using the export tools in here to um, MP3 and out. You just go to File. Uh, you do a mix down first, so select all the tracks. I won't do it now, but select all the tracks and then do mix and render. And that produces like just a stereo file with all the edits that you've made in, in one file, one stereo wave file. And then you can uh, you can make it mono as well. I usually make it mono for podcasts because talking podcasts, it doesn't happen, I don't really want it in stereo, plus it saves you a lot of space, um, so make it mono, and then I export it using, uh, let's see, in fact, yeah, and then you just use export, and you can export it to ARG, or, or um, I don't know why it says iTunes, it's whoever made the music did it in iTunes, the evil bosses, and uh, it comes up with iTunes, yeah, exactly, so it comes up with iTunes, um, I didn't do the music, I should point out. Although it is good, <laughs> I do quite like it. Um, yeah, and you just export it and then make yourself an ARC or an MP3, uh, and then that, you can put it on a server somewhere, and then, you know, you've got yourself a podcast. So, so when you've got 12 things like that, mm. how do you keep 
And you know, which is which, you don't get all the time with the things. Oh, the the thing. You can name them, yeah. They are, I think they are actually named. Um, I'll show you quickly, I'll show you Linux Outlaws finished edit as well, because I do actually make the tracks on them. Let me see. No, one or two. I think there's a good one. Find out, bro. Um, okay, so this is uh, still loaded. It's quite long. This is a nearly two hours long. Um, we've been kind of going over on the show month lately. Uh, but yeah, so it's going to take a minute to load. But um, <coughs> how do you keep track of them? I don't know. I mean, I just kind of remember where they are. I mean, it sounds stupid, but I suppose you get used to it with practice. You kind of you learn more. And Plus, the name them. You can name them, yeah. yeah. Um, it's not very obvious. You can color them as well if you want. Colors might be a bit better. Actually. I don't tend to call them, but you can see here I've called that one Dan, so that's obviously my channel. That one's called Fab, so that's his channel. Uh, this one's Music. Uh, I haven't really named that one, it's just called Hello Theme. But um, there's quite a few there, there's a little bit of announcement, that's the initial announcement. Yeah. Um, all kinds of stuff, so I tend to just name them. Um, in Audacity, can you stick more than one audio from one channel? Uh, yeah, you mean, yeah, yeah, I think so. You mean import to two and then just copy and paste it into one channel? Or? Yeah, to have them on the same channel. Which means something like an audio sequence. Yeah, so more, like more, more than one. Okay, yeah. Um, kind of in one channel. I think that would probably push all that more yeah. away from it to an audio sequence. So I think that's probably a bit far than You'd probably need to use something like Ardor for that, or something a bit more complicated. What I tend to do sometimes is to save space and so I keep track of this. If I've got lots of music that I'm importing from separate files, I'll cut and paste the music and, co and copy it into the same track, because it's all the same volume anyway. Yeah, and that way I, I can delete a lot of the extra tracks that I don't need. And that works quite well. So that's like a finished file, and um, I won't export that one because it takes ages, but that's kind of how we end up finishing it. So hopefully that gives you some idea how we produce the show. Um, let's try if I can get back to the... So we can get back into PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, no, fake life. <laughs> Slip of the <laughs> tongue. Uh, into, you, 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 might, you might struggle a bit with that in the look. <laughs> yeah, I'll just put wine and, oh. <laughs> and I'll do it that way. Uh, let's get back to slides here. Okay. Nice effect. Okay, so, next slide. Yeah, so, quick, I'll kind of some, some round up what I was talking about then. Uh, Linux Outlaws, that was the software freedom law show one I showed you that I was kind of messing about with. But um, Linux Outlaws is produced slightly differently because we're in different countries, obviously. My co host is in Germany and I'm in the UK. Um, so, what we do is we rec I, we each record our own voices locally. So, I use that little recorder. Where is it? So I use the uh, little recorder to record my voice in this country. Um, with the XLR inputs and stuff, and he has his own recording gear in, in Germany. And then we kind of talk to each other over VoIP, so um, so we can monitor what the conversation's happening. So we end up with, usually what we end up with is like a mono wave file of each of us talking. And then what I do is I take those two mono files and shove them into one stereo file, left and right, so it keeps it separate. So you've still got your separate channels. And when it comes to editing it, you can cut out you know, one bit without affecting the other person's voice and stuff. Do you, do you sync track by ear? Or yeah. Do you use the sync track and you just like three, two, one? No, what we, yeah, basically what we do is we both start recording and then um, we both, he makes noise usually at his end and I do something like put the headphones over the mic and get a, a, like a, you know, a, something, a point to sync to. Yeah. Um, so I tend to do that. I'm not that good, I can't just go, now it's in sync. Um, I wish I could. But uh, yeah, that's how we do it. We kind of sync together. That's a good together. solution, I want to thought of that to be. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to take the credit, but um, I don't know who first. <laughs> did it. I don't know who first did it, but I'm going to say that I did because I came. Up, I, I'm sure people have been doing this in radio for years, but sometime uh, early to late 2007, something like that. I, I, we, we needed a new recording solution, and I kind of hit on this idea of why don't we just both record ourselves locally and cut it together afterwards. Um, at the time, no one was doing it, and since then, Leo Laporte started doing it. So I don't know whether he copied us or, or we copied him or how that works. So as I say, I don't think I can take credit, but it did kind of occur to me. Although somebody else probably invented it earlier, I kind of reinvented it because I didn't know about their solution. Um, so it works quite well. And uh, then what I could do is he sends me his file, obviously, after the show. So last night we did a show. He uploads his file to a um, web server somewhere. I download it, um, stick them together into a stereo wave file, and sync them up, and uh, compress them and stuff, make them sound good. And then depending who's going to edit it, some, he often edits it, so I often upload the file back to a server and then he can download it and edit it and stuff. So I kind of just process them. Um, this is what it says here, create a state file. And then one of those edits it in Audacity usually as I've just shown. 
Um, so that's kind of all the stuff that we use. We don't do anything particularly fancy with it. Um, we don't use we don't use Ardor actually mostly. Um, I don't know why. We just Audacity's always done the job. Um, why overcomplicate things if it's already working? What do you think of Jacosha as a uh, method? I don't know what's happened to Jacosha. I tried it. Um, last time I tried it, I have to confess, was about probably about a year ago. So it's been a while. But they seem to have really slowed down. I don't know. Uh, they started off really well. Um, Jacosha, just in case anyone doesn't know, strange name. I, I believe it comes from. It's by it, John O'Bacon. Bacon. John O'Bacon, Bacon, yeah. Kosher. Yeah, exactly. It comes from John O'Bacon, who you might know from Canonical and Love Radio. And, and all. He's the Ubuntu community manager. He wanted to, to make a new uh, program, something a bit like GarageBand, I believe, in, in, in the Mac. So uh, he wants something like that. So that's what your is meant to do. It's meant to be simple. Um, and it is quite simple. It works. It's just got like a nice big red record button. And if you, you can put your tracks in sequence. Um, unfortunately, it never quite worked for me. I don't know why. It never stuck with me. I've always found Audacity better, but you know, try out, try them out. That's one of the great things about free software. Try out different things, see which one works best for you. Um, nice again. I'm like, okay. So, yeah, the music production. So that's all audio. That's all like podcasts, stuff like that. Um, I don't do a lot of music production these days, but I have to confess, this is the bit where you're all going to hate me now. Um, I do still have a, a copy of Windows XP. The only copy I've got in my house is on the studio machine, and it dual boots between Ubuntu Studio and XP. And I really, to be honest, I don't use XP. I'm not just saying it. I don't use XP very often. But occasionally, when I want to do some music, um, I find that, unfortunately, a lot of the tools um, for music stuff, for sequencing and stuff like that, and synthesizing, some of the so free software tools just don't seem to match up. And that's something that I thought we might want to talk about and discuss it. It's the only reason I keep it. Yeah. About, so you're not I know a lot of people are the same. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite. I'm not sure why that is, but. Well, um, programmers aren't very musical, and free software yeah, and it's just maybe, maybe. Yeah. They really kicked off a few because you know I've been doing music myself for yeah. the last ten years, and it was um, to be honest, it's partly Apple's fault. Yeah. Well, not, not really Apple's yeah. fault, but. It all harks back to like the old E-Magic days on the Atari and stuff yeah. when uh, they did the last version of Logic yeah. and they wanted to move on to newer systems because Atari was dying down in like 1994. Yeah. So um, the most logical step was to go to the Apple because Apple, the yeah. interface was virtually the same. Yeah. And it kind of followed on from there. So um, Steinberg and Cubase followed yeah. suit. Well, yeah, it seems like not music software. I don't know. I mean, one of the things I put down here, I mean, a lot of um, Pro Tools you've probably heard of, Reason and stuff like that, Ableton Live, they're all basically only work on Windows or Mac, and I, I find it really annoying. I don't know why that well, is. I think another reason why a lot of music production stuff isn't. Um, like you know, big companies that don't, they don't make for yeah. Linux is because a lot of uh, musicians, um, because they're moving from studio to studio, they need a system that just works. And they don't have to mess about. Yeah. You know, audio is a pain in the arse on anything. Yeah, audio is a pain in the arse on anything anyway. I'm going to get to that. Anyway. So um, <laughs> that's on know, the next slide. Not having to worry about you know messing about yeah. with well, sorting out sound drivers or anything like that. Um, Windows you still do to a not, point, not but same mm -hmm. with a Macintosh it is a hell of a lot easier, it's yeah. it pretty much just run the program and go. Yeah, I think that's one of the problems at the moment with, with music production, I mean, even um, even Bradley accepted that I might have to use some kind of source software to make the music for the software for the so when he yeah. said to me, will you do the music, and I said, yeah, sure. And, he, and I said to him, I can't do that all with free software. He just went, oh, I understand that, yeah, and I know it's a bit difficult. And I thought, wow, I thought he was going to try to like, kill me. But, yeah. See, a, a few years ago, I was trying to get into music on yeah. Linux, and I remember a program called Rose Garden. Rose Garden, uh, yeah. Is That's that just MIDI an audio? Or is it MIDI? It's MIDI. Does it MIDI support VST plugins? Badly. Just. Just. Uh, I was going to say, if it supported VST plugins, yeah, you'd be that'd, all right, that'd, yeah. that'd make it a lot better. Yeah. But that's the problem. The, you can, I mean, they do say you can get VST plugins working with things like VST hosts. You've got to use well. rappers, yeah. And but you use get, wine and stuff like you get, that. You get, see, I personally would not. A lot of things run quite well in wine as well. Yeah. So, like, Reason 3 runs very well. Does it? You don't get any latency issues. It's not like, really, no, it's quite good. I would have thought wine would introduce latency issues. Fails, so. yeah. I've never tried it in wine, so I just assumed it wouldn't work. Reason is, uh, just in case anyone's wondering, Reason is a, a, a program made by a company called Propellerhead Software. I believe it's like linked to the band, wasn't it? Propellerheads. No, no, no. It's named after Propellerheads. They're, they're, they're both from Sweden, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So um, they make a lot of kind of uh, audio software. Reason's one of the big ones that they make, which is obviously hideously proprietary and expensive. And stuff. It is useful, yeah. Um, to be fair. It's so like a studio in a box. Kind of, yeah. Um, so one of the problems with music on Linux, and the production of music on Linux uh, at the moment, is this this reliance that I put down there on Pro Tools, Reason, Ableton Live, stuff like that, um, and many VST plugins, proprietary plugins, are kind of like they're, they're just the industry standard at the moment, and I'm not sure exactly how we change that. Um, so I'm not really sure. An example I put down is drums. Uh, so say I'm going to make a track. I can play the drums, but I haven't got a drum kit, and I haven't got enough microphones to record it at the moment. Um, so it kind of presents a problem, so how do I do the drums? I can sit there and program them all individually per beat, which I have done, but it sounds a bit mechanical. Uh, so what I tend to do is use a program called Groove Agent, which is a VST plugin. This is it here. Um, and the great thing about Groove Agent is it actually um, kind of replicates a real person playing. It'll put little imperfections in there. So like, so if you were playing, if you had a real drummer playing, they're not going to hit every beat exactly on it. It's, it's going to have a bit of a feel to it. We use the folk or something like that called Regroup. Oh, okay. It does exactly the same thing. Yeah. Okay, I've not tried that. But, uh, I use something like, if you've heard the um, intro to uh, Linux Outlaws, the theme tune, it sounds like someone playing the drums. That's all done with Groove Agent. I couldn't do that with something like Hydrogen. I'd love to do it with something like Hydrogen, which is a, an open source um, Linux drum machine type thing. But unfortunately, it's just not possible at the minute. Um, it doesn't seem to be. So I think we've got a bit of an elephant in the room, which is music production can be a bit of a problem. So as I said, this was a bit of a discussion, I thought, at the end. Um, yeah, the future. So you're saying about the problems and stuff like me producing music. Um, I think as far as audio production goes, as I've written there, audio production on Linux, as I've shown you, like podcasts and stuff like that, is perfectly doable with Linux. It's not a problem. It's great. It's as good as any other platform. I use it in preference to other platforms, um, not just because of my belief in free software, but also because it's efficient and it doesn't crash as much as Windows and certain other things, and it, it runs on all the hardware, all the, all the usual kind of things. Um, but music production is still very proprietary, it seems, in nature, um, yeah, certainly the music industry is, uh, and it still presents us problems. So one thing I've put down here is how do we address it as free so software advocates? Um, it's kind of an open question. I don't know the answer. If I was a fantastic programmer and uh, I had, you know, infinite time. I'd rewrite Reason and you know, make it GPL or something equivalent to Reason. Um, I don't know if that's the answer. If we need to get more developers to work on this kind of stuff and make it GPL, I don't know. I think, well, I think the problem's more though, yeah. rather than just the software. Yeah. I mean, the interface for actually interfacing with hardware is a mess at the moment, mm. and it's half it's half done. Alsa only just works with most hardware, and when it comes to like professional grade interface and things yeah. completely fails and then you've got stuff like Pulse Audio, I don't know what's going on there and then you've got, and you've got OSS which is something completely different and yeah, it's just like I don't a even know. big OSS. mess of lots of things that aren't working together and just yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem with standardization as well. Well, this is something I put here. Are we duplicating our efforts? Yeah. It seems to me that we are. I don't know if this is, is something to do with free software and the fact that everybody wants to do things their own way. And, you know, they want to write, they rather than use your audio editor, I'm going to write my own because I know what I want and I can write it better. And, but, like, but then we end up with two audio editors and we're duplicating effort when we could be working on the same one. As a programmer, I can certainly say that the main problem is that everybody thinks they can do things their own way better than everyone else. Yeah, I certainly exactly. get into that mindset so many times. And mm. I know that the, the reason there's so many different things for everyone to use mm. and the nature of free software just being built by programmers, mm. there's lots of different things out there because everyone thinks they can do it better. Yeah, it does seem so to be. It, it's possibly a problem that has no solution. There's also but two, two of us that you've got there, Pulse Audio, uh, Jack, Jack's pretty much independent, but Pulse Audio and Phone yeah. are both uh, well, uh, for, the uh, sort of part of the uh, yeah. two big... Uh, the desktops, yeah. Desktop well, Pulse Audio is becoming a bug in most distributions now that use now. Okay, now, um, phone is trying to. Uh, that's KDE, yeah, that's yeah, like a KDE. Uh, but it's trying to uh, cooperate with all the other sound systems. Yeah, phone uh, a bit different. Uh, sort of be a front end to things like GStream or yeah. whatever KDE stuff. Yeah, the Z and all of other things. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think in some ways we are kind of duplicating the effort, and I, was, I don't know the answer to that. If I did, I'd go and fix it. Um, I don't know the answer to that. So, for things like the equivalents of, of stuff like Reason and Pro Tools and all that, um, I think Pro Tools, to be fair, isn't a great example because Ardor is getting there. It's commercially sponsored, isn't it, Ardor? Yeah, Ardor is. Um, Paul Davis yeah. uh, develops it. He's um, 
actually from the Bob knows him, and he knows what I'm talking about. Bob, the guy I was talking about, who's at the club, turns out he knows Paul Davis quite well, and he's contributed to the to him. Uh, Paul Davis used to work for Amazon years ago. He was one of the, I don't know, fourth or fifth, I don't know the exact numbers. He was one of the original guys who worked for Amazon, in like fifth or sixth or something like that, personally worked for them, so understandably he made a lot of money out of Amazon. Uh, he's obviously a programmer, and when he made all of his money out of Amazon, he decided what he would do with it. A lot of it was um, use his time because he now didn't need the money to work on the Jack. He, he invented Jack and he invented Ardor, which are very closely linked to those reasons. Um, at the moment, actually, last I think earlier this year, he actually announced that he was having trouble making enough money out of Ardor, and that he may have to stop development on it because he couldn't afford it, and he was asking for donations. So I don't even know what the situation with Ardor is at the moment. He hasn't really announced what he's going to do. Um, he says he might have to go back to unless he can get something like a thousand. Was it a thousand dollars a week or something like that? He wants some donations so he can get full time as a job. Yeah, it is. I don't know, but who knows? So he's talking about maybe going and letting someone else take it over, which I don't know how well that'll work. But yeah, it's a bit of a problem. So I don't know how we fix it. I just thought I'd bring it up as a kind of discussion point. One of the um, things I found, I'm a, a music producer of this, yeah. is that the expectation of the quality is incredibly low on Linux. Mm -hmm. So. You have. I, I'm a Logic user okay. by default for the past 15 years. It's yeah. like work on Logic PC before Apple bought it out and discontinued yeah. it. But um, comparing a 10-year-old version of Logic I've got to the latest version of Rose Garden, yeah. Rose yeah. Garden yeah. is decades yeah. off, and this is a 10-year-old piece of software. It was designed for Windows 98, and it's still light years ahead of something like Rose Garden. Wow. And there's big problems with things mm -hmm. like. I mean, the, the version of Ubuntu Studio, um, which was uh, with Intrepid. Didn't the, the real time kernel just didn't work? And if you look in the official, you know, known issues in this to release, oh yeah, the real time kernel doesn't work. You, and it's, needed, it's really. exactly there's very very low expectations of what is acceptable. Yeah. For Free software is like that across everything anyway. I mean, if you compare something proprietary like Photoshop to GIMP, Photoshop is miles ahead of GIMP by just so long. I mean, my own GIMP is great, it's friends and all. Like, Photoshop's a million times better than GIMP. Mm -hmm. And it's like that in so many things in Linux. I mean, if it's not useful to your average programmer, it will not be up to scratch the private stuff. That's just the way I mean, from the audio perspective, the really probably the best example is the plugins you were saying. Mm. You have this pack of 800 plugins, yeah. and I'd say that probably about 2% of them are useful, and the remaining 98% are proof of concept, yeah. things like ring modulators that nobody... Who, who uses well, a ring modulator? See, nobody think, uses a ring modulator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one person <laughs> uses a ring <laughs> modulator. One person in the room is quite a lot of large percentage, though. <laughs> as, as Dan tries to point out, there's, there's two separate um, areas for audio and music position. You've got audio work, like Dan says, for yeah. just voice work, or just general sound design, just audio editing, and then you've got musicians, now, stuff like ring modulator, um, Phasers, uh, LFOs, verbs, courses, phasers, flangers, stuff like that. You don't really want these things where you have to plug in a mathematical formula. And certainly, if you're, well, but what I mean is, if it's certainly if you are coming out of a um, a music background as opposed to a PC computer background, if you've been brought up to be to know things like you know, thinking reverb terms and stuff like that. You don't want to be presented with a list of parameters that you can put in. It just puts people off. So although there's a place for these things, it's kind of almost the wrong target audience. It's, it, it, again, it's a, it's a different thing like um, the whole garage band situation. I personally have a big bugbear with garage band because it kind of makes anyone think they're a musician. That's not the case. Mm. You've either got the talent to be a musician to put music together to have a... Um, you know, uh, song organisation arrangement skill, or you don't. And um, there is a good argument for having easy to use tools whereby instead of having stuff like, you know, LFO frequency modulation, to have a, a human readable term, like, you know, it makes it wobble, in other words. Um, but for um, musicians that are more, you know, professional or at least have more of a deep seated background in the stuff, to have the terms there. Obviously, it's incredibly useful. Um, I mean, I personally, my music experience, I started out, um, you know, doing just general uh, electronic bass music, but I also had a uh, traditional band background, because we had to in the course, 
the music tech at uh, college, we had to um, work with bands and produce the stuff. So uh, coming from that perspective, I can appreciate that you need easy to use tools for a person who doesn't understand you know, what an oscillator is and um, what an ADSR envelope does. But again, because I have gone into the field of like, experimental electronic stuff, a lot of those tools are incredibly vital to you know, push the genre forward. Um, it, as you say, there does need to be a, a, you know, importance on the um, target audience. So I agree that there should be ease of use, but not at the expense of flexibility. I suppose what I'm... It's a problem with communication as well, because you've got the two groups of people who um, do music, and just like, oh, Linux, I don't get it, I'll use Mac, and the developers who will just do things how they think, and they don't think like the musicians, well, they, so they probably need to talk to people. This is one of the points... All we need is programmers who want to make music, don't we? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the points... All we need is craft work. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it, it really is an issue with mm. us at ease of use and actually just get out and going. Um, one of the arguments I constantly use, and forgive me for using Apple and PCs, mm. but it is blatantly obvious, when you've got a PC, the, um, the modularity of a hardware is both its Achilles heel and its best thing. Mm. The best thing is you can tailor your PC however you want. But the Achilles heel is that you've got all this mishmash of hardware, it's not always going to be compatible, you're going to get latency issues with mm. something along the way, you're going to get some kind of bottleneck. With a Macintosh system, yeah, they, that's the, argument, the, the, hard, the hardware is tailored for the software, all, yeah. so there's very, very little variance in um, yeah. you know, things, so it's more yeah. likely to work well, and that's why Pro Tools only runs on certain hardware, mm. they, they can guarantee it will run on any Apple system, but for PCs you have to build it to their so specification. Yeah, so perhaps so hardware manufacturers should get into this as well. Also. Yeah, I mean, you know, Pro Tools, Pro Tools, um, whoever makes that, they won't... Uh, 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 yeah. Well, you know, they are taking a step because, you know, they're giving you, okay, this is a system we know works, we've tested it with this system. Yeah. Um, it is a, a case of, you know, just getting systems that up and run and go and work. Carillion, I think it's Carillion Day. Yeah, they make special, uh, special hardware yeah, PCs. They tailor them to, to so it works with both. But there are some, I mean, you, you talk about hardware support, but there are some. Um, it seems to be only select groups, like I mentioned the RME card that I've got for. That's as good as you get in a lot of studios. Yeah, and that works brilliantly with ELSA, ELSA, basically because RME want to support Linux as well, and they have a big developer community you to do that. You have to know it though, and I find this information extremely hard to get hold of. It doesn't yeah. seem to be like a central Linux audio um, producer's <laughs> community. There are, sites, yeah, there are sites that try, like you go to certain places and they say, you know, there's a list of all the audio cards that work. Well, yeah, and, and, it's got and if nobody it's updates work, it, yeah. And, yeah. And, and you end up within a, a couple of years, it's completely out of date. Yeah. And it's not much use. But I mean, I, I, I know that list, and it's a complete nightmare. It's, yeah. a, it's a horrible thing. But there, is, there are companies, I don't know, I should have got the name of them, but there are companies in America who build audio PCs, uh, or who build studio PCs around Linux, and you buy, like, like Carillon, I think you know, Carillion or Carillon, however you pronounce them, they build PCs dedicated to this kind of application. But they, they specialize in Windows. They do Windows stuff, yeah. but there are companies in America that will sell you, like, a, a specialized rack-mounted PC with all the hardware in it, which is just for audio production. Yeah, but has those circuit boards been made for uh, Windows, or has those circuit boards been made for uh, Linux? Um, I don't know. Or are they what they do? Or are they really getting on the back of the, uh, of the need for um, hardware that has actually been designed for Linux? I don't think they're it together. They're cobbling it together. I don't think it's really a case. I think they get the Windows hardware that they can make work. Yeah, it's no, it's basically it work. It's not start from the drawing board and say we'll. we'll no, they're not designing the circuit boards just from that. I don't think. Um, I think uh, same with something like RME who make lots of audio cards, they target mainly Windows obviously because that's the main market for them and then Mac and they also make them work on Linux as well. I think that's probably their last concern unfortunately. Yeah. So anyway, um, we should probably all discuss this afterwards but anyway I just wanted to kind of bring it up because I think there's a bit of an elephant in the room which is that how do we get more musicians using Linux, how do we make it easier? 
I think it's a problem, and we should, you know, it's something that needs to be discussed openly. I, mean, first, I know this is a bit of a cliche, but the first step to fixing problems is admitting that you've got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so if we all walk around going, oh, 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 that's fantastic, and we can do that with hydrogen if we want to. And all. I'm not sure that we can. I think we need to kind of address the problem, and maybe maybe we need new software, new free software, who knows? Uh, more programmers, I'm open to ideas, but uh, I thought it was something that we should bring up. Hardware support's the one I mentioned at the end. Um, so I'll move it on just so we don't end up, I think, I don't know how we're doing for time. So I think we're up to the last slide, actually. Third time lucky, there you go. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> to nine? Yeah, that's right. To 12? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's still light out, so that was kind of like you. Um, when it goes dark, I'll show up. Um, so, yeah, um, to kind of round up then, um, yeah, I, obviously I said I wanted to just uh, introduce that kind of discussion point. We can all talk about it later, I'm sure. People who are interested, people who aren't, obviously, will be able to escape. Um, <laughs> See, <laughs> listen about oscillators for three hours if you don't want to. If you want to, of course, you want to know. Um, so, yeah, um, if, if you want to discuss audio production or, or you want to ask me any questions, please do. Um, my email address is dan at danlynch.org. Um, feel free to email me or you can just grab me or whatever and we'll have a chat. Um, check out linuxoutlaws.com. I've just put some gratuitous plugs at the end. Check out linuxoutlaws.com and also softwarefreedom.org is where you can find um, the Software Freedom Law Show. That's, um, as I said, the SFLC's website. That's where they do stuff. Um, so have a look at those. And does anybody want to ask any questions about what I've talked about? Yeah. Yeah. I might be showing engagement stupidity. Mm -hmm. uh, I do that a lot. Don't I? Okay. Uh, once you've done your podcast and it's all hunky dory, mm. uh, then uh, you want to launch it on the uns yeah. unsuspecting world. Mm. Uh, are you reliant on uh, um, Google's hosting? Uh, well, no. Or is there a way that you can kind of index that to, and, and point it towards the year? Uh, Whatever yeah, thing you that you want. So you're talking about distribution of the file? Or yeah, of the podcast. Well, um, I suppose you mean, do you want to get it listed in Google and get no, find no. it, or do you want to host it? With Google? Uh, well, well then I suppose that would be dependent on the particular person's website. Or yeah. Whatever. Is there a bandwidth question? There is. Yeah. What well, basically a list of uh, pods, hosts? Podcasts. There are a few. Um, we use one called Livsyn. Um, L I V S Y N dot com. Um, I'm just trying to remember the address. Yeah, dot com. Um, they uh, uh, dedicate basically. They do specific podcast hosting, if you like. The problem with podcasts is the bandwidth, because you're producing large files. So, say the average episode in the next oh, this is 50 megabytes or something like that. So you, you, you might just shove it on Google or shove it into the internet. Well, you'd have to have hosting, but then have a link to some kind of list. Yeah. Index of the oh, like a directory, you mean? There are podcast directories. There's one called Podcast Alley, which is quite popular. Does that automatically submit to iTunes? I know you're on iTunes. We're on iTunes, yeah. Um, how, how do you get on? You have to submit it. I had to get someone else to do it because I don't have iTunes. Um, so you actually have to use the iTunes program? You have to use to iTunes to submit it. That's yeah. horrible. It is. Yeah, and that's that's hence why I don't do it. That's, um, that's that right? Yeah, but my co host is an iPod owner and he um, didn't have iTunes. I uh, don't own an iPod, so I haven't got iTunes. I have a big issue with iTunes. I really don't like it. Um, I don't like the tie-in. Um, I think there's a bit of a split thing. You talk about hosting and, and also listing public like promotion, if you like. Um, hosting is slightly different. Hosting, you need you just need a web server, really, within reason. You just need somewhere, some web space where you can upload that file where people around the world can access it and download it in basic terms. Obviously, you've got bandwidth problems. You've got like a free hosting package with someone. You're likely, if your podcast is popular, you're likely to break the bandwidth limits pretty quickly um, and get you know, get taken off, and then you have to pay for more bandwidth. How many people, how many, um, to uh, about somewhere around, well, I don't know exactly, about eight to ten thousand. Or something like that. Okay. Um, so. You can't host it on like you know. Your own. I'll host it on your NCL World account. No. Um, well, not unless you know, not unless you sort of crash it. You can try. But if you think about it, it's every file is say 50. I mean, I'll use 50 megabytes because it's a nice round and it's an hour back. So roughly 50. My notes are free to social networking sites for podcasts. There are some. There's one called. Um, what's it called? It's Podio. Is one of them. Um, I think it's Podio.com. P-O-D. 
io.com. They will list your site, but they want to put, list your podcast, and they'll host it for you. Right. But they want to put adverts on it. Oh, um, they insert adverts. They insert the adverts. Uh, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, yeah, before the start of the show, they'll put adverts. Yeah, Libsyn have just started doing that. Have they? The, um, the Association of Music Podcasting okay. people, um, they're in the middle of discussions with we'll to get an eye on that. Um, but Libsyn have said that um, basically the Association, of music, no, the Association of Music Podcasting, which promotes um, pod safe music, um, they've got an agreement with Libsyn mm. that they get, I don't know if it's cheap or free hosting. Oh, okay, so they can do the just in their podcast. Yeah, they need to have, they, they're having like a, a five to ten seconds. Uh, lead advert, up yeah. advert, and then anything up to two, up to a minute, lead it's out to the end. A minute. Wow, that's boring. I, I started using um, website recently. My friend, um, it's mm. called uh, Bandcamp, mm. and what you do is you can you upload your music to it. Um, I think I've heard of that. Is that where people can remix it? No, no, no. It, no. It, it's, like, it's like a distribution site for music. Okay. But the the idea is is that. People can go onto it and listen to it for free with a little flash player, and then mm. they can download it if they like. It's like okay. by low quality MP3, but optionally they could like pay Why? for pay for it and download like high quality um, mm. flat files or something like that. I so, but, but, yeah. but there's no adverts or anything like that. So I think I think for podcasting it might work quite well because you could just set up an album which would be Linux out was yeah. and you could just be yeah. adding new tracks. You don't need spoken words to be more than like eight kilobit. Yeah, free, really. You could do it in low yeah. quality. Yeah. I mean, we do ours at 64. With, with, with Bandcamp, okay. you upload the WAV files, mm. and on their server, they encode they it can. as uh, MP3s and FLACs okay. and lots of things, and people can either just download the low quality ones, or mm. they can um, pay a small amount of money, as much as you like, because it's similar to what I think Radiohead did recently, where mm. they released their album, and you can yeah, whatever you like for it. Um, minimum charge three pounds. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, you, you can set a minimum. Charge to rob it, John. <laughs> <laughs> she, she tweeted it. It's her fault. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I said that because of PayPal. All oh, right. <laughs> there's a lot of these kind of things going on. Um, bandwidth is probably the big problem. But the thing is, if, yeah, you can torrent things. You could put a bit. You could put a torrent up. Um, the main thing is you usually use stuff like um, RSS feeds for podcasts, obviously, so you can keep up to date when new one comes out. The problem with torrents is their life is bad. Really. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, when the next episode's out, the last episode will probably not be seen at all anymore, and you won't get it out. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised. That's it. We, when, we, when we got to our, we recently did 100 episodes, we got to our 100th episode. When we got to our 50th episode, which seems a long time ago. We decided to try and do something special, and one of the things we did was get all of the previous episodes and package them up into a big uh, archive and upload them to uh, the Pirate Bay, which we found gone. Which <laughs> <is> <laughs> the, at the time, we uploaded it to the Pirate Bay and we told people, we seeded them like, personally, and we got people on our forums and other people listening to the video. Yeah, and who we <laughs> well, it's all free content, so, yeah, so I don't think so. And for us, it was a distribution medium, but uh, that's still hosted now. I stopped seeding it long ago, I have to confess, I can gave up about, I mean, it was, this was well over a year ago, I gave up a few months ago, I kind of stopped seeding it a little, that's enough then. You know, I've, I've seeded it for eight months, I think that's enough. Um, but there are still people seeding it, so I don't know, you know, you never underestimate the, the, you know, the support people want to give maybe, it. Maybe it's a large archive, but you can like, set to set like, Yeah, we can Yeah, yeah distributing a large file. Yeah. And the idea, yeah, is your unit. Mm. Well, the other thing is, if you do, if you did find, if you do have ideas and you want to start a podcast, um, don't immediately start by worrying about what happens if 100 million people download it. Try it first, and once you get that problem, it's a nice problem to have. You know, if, <laughs> you see if it works first, and then if it's popular, then you can, you know, you can start to worry about that kind of thing. I haven't been on the Zappos website, but you have a tip jar and like that. Yeah, we have PayPal. Um, we get a surprising amount of, of donations through PayPal. There's some quite large ones. You mention them. We do, yeah. We always, well, I like to try and mention anybody who gives us a donation just just because I think it's, you know, it's good, good courtesy to do that and say thank you. And, you know, I mention everybody who, who definitely who, um, donates to us. Uh, yeah, and hosting as well. It covers hosting and, and bandwidth costs and stuff for us. The good thing about sites like Big Soon, which we talked about, they uh, are tailored to podcasting, so they offer a lot of bandwidth for a little amount of money. Um, so you pay something like, I think it's $10 a month for a standard Libsyn account, and the bandwidth is actually unlimited on Libsyn. But what they do is they charge you um, per 
the amount of disk space you want to use on their server. So you can sign up for say ten, I think it's ten dollars a month for, I think that's like a hundred megabytes per month. You can upload to their server, so that would only be two shows, probably not even two shows for us. So in a month, that's not be enough. But we we pay something like thirty or thirty dollars or forty dollars a month, yep. and then they just give you a lot of bandwidth for that, which is quite cool. It might be. I mean. This probably isn't something you want to look at because you're probably pretty happy with Erlison. Mm. But um, in my experience, Media Temple are for pretty okay. good sort of. Because I get like a terabyte of bandwidth a month. Yeah, Dreamhost is another with, one. Yeah, Dreamhost. Like, um, I, I've got a Dreamhost account. I, I do another podcast as well about music called Rap Hall Radio, and I host that myself on a, on a Dreamhost account, just a standard $5 a month Dreamhost account, which gets, I think, 5 terabytes. <coughs> 5 terabytes limit for this. How many people download Rap Hall Radio? I think we started. Ten it, people. Uh, yeah, about ten. <laughs> I think uh, possibly twelve. Now, um, <laughs> now I think uh, I think there's been about a few hundred probably downloaded the first episode. It went to about a thousand in the second episode, and I've only done three. No, four. I've done four now. Yeah, so I don't even remember how many of them. Um, so I think it's you know it's a bit hit and miss. It may not work out. Who knows? But that's the good thing is you can try it, and I think it's a big opportunity because. I think years ago, you, there was no way you could talk to people on the other side of the world and produce a, a, a radio show that anybody in the world could listen to. I mean, not everybody in the world is going to listen to it, but the fact that we've got listeners in you know, Guatemala and who knows where, who email us and say, oh, I've been listening to your podcast. And we had an email from Uganda the other day, a guy who runs a blog in Uganda who listens to our show. And when I started it, I really didn't think anyone outside of our street would listen to it. Um, so that's kind of amazing the power that it gives you. So I mean, I would, I would encourage anyone to give it a go. You don't need a lot of expensive equipment, as a, as a point out. I mean, I, I do tend to use uh, expensive microphones or reasonably expensive microphones. That's just because I'm addicted to microphones. Um, you can get like you could do a podcast with a USB headset or something like you know, twenty quid. You can you could record the podcast with that. It's not going to sound brilliant, but um, it's not going to sound terrible either. And I've heard a lot of podcasts that sound pretty awful. So, and some of them quite popular as well. So, um, you know, give it a go and then, you know, get maybe invest in better equipment later and stuff like that. Uh, look, I think it's probably worth mentioning uh, yes. more like uh, the social impact of podcasts because, Ooh. you know, everyone knows YouTube and everyone knows the yeah. crap you get on YouTube um, because it's got so popular. Podcasts, I think it's, it's popular enough, yeah. but it's, it's still it's not quite like the trolls or anything. It's still the use now. Yeah, it's it it's it's, it's, a, it's a great way because it's I reckon it's one of the good components of you know the positive things about the internet because you know so many people are about you know about the internet. Yeah, I mean. this is you know this is one of the good things you can get a voice out there. You can talk about anything you want, any subject you want. Doesn't yeah, matter what it is, and there will be someone that wants to listen to it. Well, that's the thing. I mean, one of the one of the, you mentioned iTunes before, and one of the reasons we decided to. Part into iTunes was to reach people who maybe needed to hear what we were yeah. saying, rather than just preaching to the converted all exactly, the time, which yeah. is which is great. I mean, uh, it's great to, to get free software fans on board and stuff. But sometimes when you're trying to you know extol the virtues of using free software, they're not the first people you want to target because they're already using it. So exactly. you want to get people who aren't using it. And we actually get a lot of downloads from the Zoom store, which I find hilarious. Um, yeah, the Microsoft Zoom um, media. Yes. Some people have a Zoom. They're actually very popular in America. Are they? Yeah, they are. Are they? Okay. <laughs> right, okay. Well, um, yeah, we get quite a lot. We're on the Zoom store. I don't know how we got on the Zoom store, but we are on the Zoom store. Um, I don't know if Microsoft know about it, but um, we've had a few people. They probably who, added you to it. They might have. Because they're going on a Linux thing at the moment. Yeah, maybe that's the They're in the embrace stage at the moment. Yeah, yeah, extinguishes next. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, extends next. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they start adding little apps. It's just put micro one. Yeah. Port twenty one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, we we get all kinds of weird, you know, strange like uh, people listening, not strange people, strange <laughs> groups that you wouldn't expect listening, you know, cold groups or listening groups, which is cool. And yeah, if you've got something you want to say, you want to spread it, you want to spread the message, or you know, so, and it doesn't matter what it is, you can give it a go. That's the great thing about the internet. Just like the, uh, the, the evangelical. Uh, like the Scientology so, podcast. Yeah, like they must have a podcast. I've not looked. It's probably really well produced as well. Yeah. <laughs> probably got George Lucas as well. Yeah, exactly. 
So, anyone want to ask anything else? Yeah, they'll ever get the point where the awards for matches. The kind of doing podcasts in the same level that um, you do with YouTube and live journals and things like everybody that. Everybody seems, well, I say everybody, but almost everybody you know seems to have a blog these days. Yeah. And not that long ago, people said that wouldn't take off. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, it could do. Um, I, I think it'll take a little while longer because yeah. YouTube is such a synonymous brand. Most people automatically go for YouTube first yeah. to you know, get the message out. I think, I think podcasts will still be, you know, useful for a while before yeah. it gets funded. I think right. the there's currently no central thing for, for podcast radio, is there, like there is with, um, with YouTube? Yeah. yeah. I, guess, I guess you kind of needed a, a platform more like YouTube for the size of videos, that, you know, the size of amount of data that you have to ship yeah. out to, to yeah. do video there. So, kind of having one If Google moves into doing podcasting, then that's probably when they well, get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably, you know, when they make it so you can like click on the desktop and like quick save as podcast as well. Yeah. Um, that'll probably be quite popular. Well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyone asking anything else? Or, I mean, I'll, obviously I'll be around, so if you want to discuss anything after this, please feel free. So, thanks very much for listening. And sweating and cramming into this little room. Thanks very much.